And in my time of prayer, the Lord began to direct me and show me what He was wanting me to preach this morning, dealing with all of the, the uncertainty that is everywhere. And one of the things that I said last night is the fact that in the midst of all of the uncertainty of everything around us, the good news is that God is always a constant. When there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things are up in the air, you need a constant in your life. If you have a parent, somebody that you're close to, somebody that you love dearly, no matter what happened in your life, that you could always go to your mom or you could always go to your dad and you could always say, hey, what would you do in this situation? Or just somebody you could vent to. There's a sense of reassurance when you have a constant, somebody you can go to. When you're in a marriage situation and you know that if you get sick, that husband or that wife, they're going to be by your side. You have a constant. Or maybe you're a church member and you go through different difficulties. Maybe you go through, unfortunately, things within your relationship, maybe a marriage, maybe with your kids, your family. And you know that you can always pick up the phone and you can be able or have a conversation and say, you know, the pastor's been a constant if I needed help or whatever. It just feels good to know you have a constant in your life. And I want you to know this morning that God is absolutely our, as a church, our constant. He's that thing that's always there. He's that one that will always stand by your side. Even in times that it may seem like God's not there, He is. Have you found that to be true? We're going to be reading out of the book of Nehemiah this morning, chapter number 9, verse number 19. This particular passage is reminiscent of things that transpired early on in the lives of the people of Israel. God's way of using the man of God to reminisce how that God's people have not always been faithful, but on the other hand, God had been. I want you to think about that for a minute because truly, all of us that are here this morning could say, I've had times in my life, Brother Myers, that I hadn't always been as faithful to God as I should have been. But aren't you thankful that God, even in spite of our unfaithfulness, that He's faithful? That's what is being exemplified in Nehemiah's writings, chapter number 9, verse 19. For sake of time, I'm not going to read the four texts because I believe we'll get lost in the depth of what God's trying to show us here. If you're listening online, God bless all of you. I know some of you can't be here because of different reasons. Pastor Myers loves you either way, and I'm glad that you were able to tune in with us today. I hope that this will be a blessing. Listen all the way to the end if you really want to get the real gist of what God's trying to say to you. Nehemiah 9 and verse number 19, if you have it, say amen. Amen. He says, yet thou... This thou that he's talking about, he's talking about God. He says, yet thou, in thy manifold mercies, forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way. Neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth. Gavest them water for their thirst. What I want you to see as we read this text this morning, I want you to understand that He was their direction and He was their guidance. He was their provision. Read that verse again. Thou gave us also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth, and gave us them water for thirst. He was their direction and guidance. He was their provision. Verse number 21, the Bible said, Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. 
Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. He was their constant during the duration of the wilderness experience. The only thing that I want you to see here that was predictable about the life of a child of God living during this predicament, being in the wilderness, the only thing predictable was the fact that God was going to be there. With so much uncertainty everywhere they looked, the only thing, Brother Coon, that was a predictable element was I know that when I get up in the morning, I know God will be there. When I go throughout the day, I know God's going to be there. So many uncertainties in life, but I know that I can count on God. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to preach a thought I've never preached on a cloud in the midst of uncertainty. Will you raise your hand to the Lord and pray and ask God to have His will and way? Lamb of God, we're so ever thankful for the privilege once again to preach the Word of God without fear or favor. Lord, this morning you know that it would be easy in my human flesh to be distracted by so many different things going on all around me. But I pray this morning that you'll allow me to penetrate through all of the different stressors and be able to preach the Word of God in clarity so that it may be understood and received and it may be a benefit and a blessing to the hearer. And we'll give you praise for everything you do and everyone can say amen. And you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, some of you that may be online may not know this, but I mentioned this earlier in service. My wife is scheduled for exploratory surgery tomorrow, so your pastor has a lot on his mind, but with the help of the Lord, we're going to preach this message. The first thing I'd like to do is I'd like for us to just kind of take a moment and uh, look back into the text a bit, maybe better understand what it might have been like to be an Israelite during the time that they were transitioning into this wilderness experience. Take for a moment and think about the fact that these people were in Egyptian bondage prior to the manna that was poured out, prior to the water coming out of a rock, prior to many of the things that we have read about in our text, we understand that they were slaves in Egyptian bondage. But you see, as we lead up into that time, you have to think what it would have been like to be the Israelite who was just in Egyptian bondage, and you were a slave, but every part of your life is organized by somebody else. If I could put it like this, it would be similar to maybe being a child who is at home And a parent has every part of your day mapped out. When you get up, you're going to get a shower. You're going to take a shower, brush your teeth, comb your hair, put on some clothes. You're going to sit down at the table, eat breakfast, and then I'm whisking you off to the school bus to take you to school. And when you get home, you're going to do homework, and you're going to, we're going to go out to eat, and then we're going to blah, blah, blah. Your whole life as that young child would be orchestrated and organized by that parent, that one that oversees the affairs of your life. Now, if you think of it as an Israelite in slave captivity, every part of their life is governed by those that were the slave masters, those who who orchestrated every part of their day. It was organized. They, They knew what to expect every day. They knew that if they were getting up, they were told, you're going to work here or you're going to labor there. They knew that it would be a long, hard day. They knew that because of the regiment of the of the day and the organization of their lives, they knew that every day that they were going to eat and many times they already knew because they ate the same thing quite often what to expect. And I want you to know that whenever life throws this curveball at you when all of a sudden that organized life of the young child and they're thrown out into the real world, it's, it's a culture shock. It's all of a sudden everything seems like that the seams have come unraveled. All of the threads in the garment have come out and the garment's falling apart. That's the way that it may have been for the children of Israel because everything that had been a constant 
daily routine is now gone. They, they have to understand that their knowledge of the, the lay of the land, that is gone. You see, whenever you live in a certain place, there's a certain knowledge of the lay of the land that gives you a certain reassurance. How many of you know that you, you can know where you live at so well that if a stranger comes, you can tell them, well, you go down this street and when you see that gray mailbox, you take a ride and when you hit that dip in the bottom of the, the road, you know that you need to take a left there because you know the lay of the land and there's a certain peace of mind because when you decide you want to go to Publix or Walmart, you already know where the store is. You know where you park your car and you know where to get in it. You know where to put the key and you drive to the store because you don't have to worry because you know the lay of the land. You have a routine. You have an understanding and a knowledge. You see the land that they are in now, they have no idea anything about it. They don't know where the nearest water hole is. They don't know where things are. They are in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. And because of this, there is a great level of uncertainty. If you can imagine what it would be like to be them when the knowledge of the lay of the land has gone and their insurance of the next meal is gone, you would see that the absolutes of everyday life are beginning to fall by the wayside. They don't know whether they're going to eat and they don't even know what they're going to eat because they are at the mercy of the land. I mean, it would be like me taking you out into the middle of the desert and saying, now we're going to trek through here. We don't really know where we're going and we're headed in a direction, but we're not positive what to expect. We don't know if in the night you're going to get attacked by a mountain lion. We don't know really much of anything. Everything has been turned on its head. Can you say, God help? You see, all of these absolutes are gone. And there was an incredible, incredible level of uncertainty everywhere that the Israelite people looked. This uncertainty is one of the hardest challenges that life will ever throw at you. You want to talk about a place of your life where that you feel so emotionally stretched, paper thin, you let uncertainty come into your life. Not know where you're going to live. Not know what you're going to eat. No, not knowing how you're going to get to work or if you even have a job. These things are, are difficult. I mean, it's one thing to know that every week you've got a paycheck coming in and you can go to the store and buy some cereal and milk for your babies and you can buy some biscuits and gravy and chicken and, you know, white rice and make that for dinner this week. But when you don't know whether or not there's an animal out there to kill and how you're even going to start a fire to be able to cook it on the fire and, and how it's going to turn out and, and if there's going to be enough food for everybody, there are so many uncertainties uh, that it can train wreck a person mentally. And if you can only imagine if for us that, that tomorrow all of our securities and all of our assurance and absolutes were removed from our life, you're not certain whether or not your spouse is going to leave or stay. or You're not certain whether you're going to have a job tomorrow or you might end up being unemployed. or You don't know whether you're going to eat tomorrow or you're going to have to skip a few days for your next meal. You don't know whether or not you're going to lay down to sleep tonight you don't know whether you're going to find a place to sleep. You don't know where that's going to be and don't even know that during the night that you might be, be bit by a serpent or you might be attacked by a wild animal. There are so many uncertainties uh, that this is a daily struggle in the minds of the people. You see, it's easy when we serve the Lord on the mountaintop. Say amen. It is easy when everything's laid out. It's easier, should I say, to be able to, to love on the Lord. But it is during the trying times that our real love for God is put to the test. Can I tell you right now, church, that the, the church is right there. I remember being in Mayaka City and telling the church way back then, probably about 2006 or 2007, and I said to the church, I said, I see a day coming where that many of the people who sit on our church pews who are only in this for the fishes and the loaves uh, are going to be sifted uh, and we're going to find out who's really in this for the right reason uh, and who's not really in it for the right reason. And I believe
believe this morning that as a church we're beginning to see that sifting taking place all around us and we're beginning to see who really has got it and who don't. Who's going to stay in the fight and who won't. And I believe that it's being played out right before our eyes as we realize the struggle is real. You see, some of us can identify with what I am saying and I can assure you that I know what it feels like to be dumped into a place all of the sudden of uncertainty. Years ago, my family lived in a little single wide mobile home trailer in Claremont, Florida. And during this particular time, we had three children, three small young children at that particular time. And we had this verbal agreement with the man that owned the mobile home. And that agreement was a lease to own agreement. It was somebody that we knew and so we didn't feel the need to make out a contract or write anything down on paper. And when I mentioned it, he just plainly told me, we don't need that. You know me and I'll make sure everything's right. And so here we are, Sister Misty, I got my three kids, my wife, I've got a job, we're living here, we're secure here. And then all of a sudden one day, I get a phone call and the man tells me that he sold the house and lo and behold, the man that he sold the house to was a preacher that I knew. He bought the house right up from underneath me. I didn't understand it. It was confusing. And I'm thinking to myself, well, surely I've got at least some sort of rights here. Surely I ought to have a couple of days and months maybe to be able to get all of my stuff out and figure out where are we going to live and what are we going to do. Surely I've got some sort of legal right. And so I got on the phone and I called the local sheriff's department and I I said, you know, here's my situation. And they said, well, do you have a lease agreement? I said, no. Do you have a contract? I said, no. They said, well, you got three days to get out. Let me tell you, whenever you got five people in a family, you got a job that you got to be there the next morning at 4.30 in the morning. You got to get up and be to work at 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning. And now you got to figure out how we're going to pack an entire house with five people and try to get it done. Amen. Washers and dryers and I have nowhere to live and I know, don't, don't know where I'm going to go and I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids. What are they going to eat and how am I going to take off of work for three days and then be able to afford bills next week because I took off of work. Everything was so uncertain. Everything was up in the air and I want you to know that it was a place in my life that I got tried. I'm telling you, I got tried because I'll tell you what the devil will do. The devil will get on your shoulder and say, now if God was in control and if God really loved you and if paying tithes really was a blessing and if being faithful really meant something, don't you think God would have made sure this couldn't happen to you? I want you to know it rains on the just and the unjust alike but in the meanwhile when you're going through it, it's easy to be all braggadocious about your spiritual talk and walk but when you're in the middle of that thing you come tell me about faith it really takes a toll on whether you got it or you don't say amen I want you to know that it really, really worked on me. But as I was preparing this morning and I got ready to sing, I felt like the Holy Ghost showed me something. You see, right now the world that we were living in is going through so much. And I felt like the Lord showed me in so many words that if we are going to be leaders, that we're going to have to be able to lead during the most difficult times. You see, any pastor can get up when the church is in revival and any pastor can take a church that's already running a high number and maybe maintain during the good times. But when adversity comes is when leadership is tried. Let me tell you moms, you've been holding on to the plow while your husband don't want to serve the Lord. You're being tried right now and you come home from work and you're stressed out and you feel like the world and the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Husbands that are going to work and you don't know whether you're going to get 
get laid off, you don't understand what tomorrow holds. And the weight of the world is on your shoulders. I want you to know that it's in an uncertain time. But it is in them uncertain times that God is able to make those that really got it shine like pure gold. Do you remember what Job said? He said, when I come forth, he said, I'm going to come forth like pure gold. I want you to know you may not be shining right now, but I tell you, if you'll be faithful and you'll lead during the worst of times, let me tell you, as a pastor of any church, and I'm not talking about me, if you can pastor right now during the mess the church is going through and help lead the church through this by the grace of God, when it's all over with, you'll have a group of church folk who can have confidence in your ministry. But if you let go of the plow now, pastor, and if you let go of the plow now, evangelist, and if you let go of the plow now, mom and daddy, what will that say of your leadership? I'll tell you what you ought to do. You grip, come on, you get a reposition your grip like I preached last week. Put your hand on that plow and hold it, honey, like you ain't never held it. If you got sweat stinging your eyes, keep plowing. If you feel like your feet are getting tired, keep plowing. If you feel like you can't go another day, keep plowing. If you feel like the world is on you, keep on plowing. Because let me tell you, that day's in. There's one that said, I'll be with you all the way, even unto the end. Does anybody feel what I'm preaching this morning? Will you give the Lord praise? My God, can you give him praise? I want you to know some folk, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Will you praise the Lord? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God's answer for the Israelites' uncertainty. I said God's answer for the Israelites' uncertainty. (laughs) You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what you're going to eat. You don't know where you're going to lay your head. You don't know what is up ahead of you tomorrow. But God said, I've got an answer for your uncertainty. Can I preach to you for a while on a cloud? I said on a cloud in the midst of uncertainty. A cloud in the midst of uncertainty. You see, what we have to understand, folk, is that a cloud in the middle of the desert, which is where they were. When the Bible said the wilderness, it didn't mean the Ocala National Forest. It meant the middle of nowhere. It was a desert like the Mojave Desert, out in the middle of nowhere, cactus and all kind of place, rocks and sand. And this is where they are. And during this particular time, the heat of the day is so blistering uh, that a few minutes in the sun could cause somebody a direct heat stroke. And I tell you, God came along and God said, I see that you got a need. I see that you can't do this by yourself. I see that there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't have sunscreen, but God said, I got you. I don't know where I'm going, but God said, I lead the way. I don't know what's up ahead, but God said, keep following that cloud. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't know what I ought to do next. God said, don't worry. I've got you covered. You just keep marching for it and follow my lead. <laughs> Woo! Can you say praise the Lord? The fire by night that God sent in the desert. They say the blistering heat during the day is almost unbearable. But at night, when nightfall comes, they say that it is such a brisk cold that it'll just about chill you to the bone. And God said, I got you covered in the day. And I... I got you covered when the sun is shining and I got you covered when it all gets dark. Whenever you get cold, I got you covered. When you're hot, I got you covered. Whenever that's that cold set in, Brother Eric Joyner, do you know that God said, I'll give you a warmth. And not only will I keep warming you, but when it gets dark, I'll make sure. You see, a cloud would just shadow the whole situation at nighttime. So God said, I'm okay to change things up. I'll give you a cloud by during the day, but at night time, I'll give you something else because what worked during the day may not work at night and you may have leaned on something that worked 10 years ago, but God said, I got a different plan for right now. Oh yeah. 
I want you to imagine what it must have been like to be the children of Israel out in the middle of a lonely desert. Uncertainty everywhere you look. You got your children. Folks, I think we fail to understand this was not just a healthy group of of 25 and 30 year old men and women. This was a band, this was a whole entire nation, if you will, of people. Several thousands of people came out of that bondage. I think somebody said around 400,000. I don't remember the exact number, but it was a lot of people that came out of that bondage. And you've got elderly people. There were some sister Misty's in the crowd with your, your dad's name, Alvin. There were some sister Misty's in the crowd with some Alvins in tow. There were some parents like Sister Linda with some Catherines and Roberts in tow and Olivia's and, and Rose. There were some men like Pastor Myers with sick wives, barely able to get by. It was a scene where everybody is facing this uncertainty. What are we going to do during this particular time? I want you to know that's not an easy place for you to be in. But I want you to know that 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 cloud by day and that fire by night, it's not just God's Old Testament GPS. Oh, no. That pillar of cloud by day became a shelter from the intense heat. A fire by night was was that, that warmth at night. It was God giving them protection, God giving them provision, and God giving them direction. If we've ever needed protection, we need it right now if we've ever needed provision we need it right now have you ever wondered how will the church survive if we keep going like this we won't be able to have camp meetings anymore we won't be able to have youth camps anymore what will the nursery do what will the children's church do let me tell you it might be uncertain times but God told me to tell you you just keep following that cloud by day and fire by night Somebody give the Lord praise. I want you to see this morning that this pillar of cloud is an expression of God's mercy. Do you remember what the text said? I want to read you verse number one. Verse number one, the Lord, or verse, the first verse, he said, he said, yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsook them not. What is that saying, Pastor Myers? That is an expression of the mercy of God. The manifold mercies. That is God having mercy on your condition. God having mercy on you in the heat. God having mercy on you when you don't know what to do. Manifold. That means all sorts of mercies. Mercies with an S. That means many. That means God's not just showing you mercy here and maybe skip a few days in there but his mercies uh, amen the psalmist said they endure forever aren't you glad that God said his mercies endure forever that's the kind of mercies that he uh, spoke of when he said manifold mercies my God in heaven that cloud was inseparable from its mission to lead them the Bible said that that cloud by day that fire by night it departed not from them You remember what he said in the New Testament? He said, I will never, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But I will go with you always unto the end. In other words, I know that it don't feel like I'm with you right now, but I am. When you're sitting in the doctor's office and you have to make decisions for you and your dad, and you've got things going on at work and you have everything piled up and you've got five text messages to answer and your husband just asks you what's for dinner and the weight of the world is on your shoulders, you can be assured that God is still right there. He's not way off in the distance. He's right there. He said, I'm not going to depart from you. That cloud, the Bible said, it did not depart from them. When it was nighttime and they had to lay down, at night and sleep in places that they knew not in a land they knew not in a place that they were uncertain of God was right there with them and that cloud didn't go nowhere 
Ask her if I'm laying on my back in the hospital, will he be there? Yeah. I want you to know this morning, that cloud by day and that fire by night was evidence that God recognized their need. For direction and provision. God recognized their need. He recognized the times that you went out and didn't bring many fish in. And your body's getting old. And you can't do it like you used to. And the engine on the motor ain't doing like it's supposed to. The engine on the boat's sometime acting up and half the time you feel like you got to rig it up to make it to work and you say what in the world are we going to do and you sit back and wonder how will we be able to make the bills if this and that and the other will I get social security will that be enough to sustain us what am I going to do if my husband leaves for work one morning and has a heart attack out there on that boat a lot of uncertainty but one thing you can know that when you get up in the morning and you look around and you feel on the other side of the bed and brother Coon's already on the lake that you can look up and say let that cloud be with him today God let that cloud be there with him when you get lost in the woods he said I was that cloud by day and that fire by night when you are hanging upside down in that tree stand God said I was the cloud by day and I was the fire by night whenever coronavirus spiked and everybody shut down and the church said we don't know if the church is going to fold or close the doors God said I'm still the cloud by day and the fire by night. Somebody raise your hand and give God praise. I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Go ahead and worship Him for a moment, folk. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Just worship Him. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. I don't want you to miss this. Very valuable, very vital for you to understand this. The value of this cloud by day and fire by night was not, it was not, it was not just God saying, I'm here to tell you what to do. God did not just send a cloud by day and a fire by night just to say, this is what you got to do. That cloud by day and fire by night was also God saying, This is what you got to do. But I sent it to help you get it done. When you're out there pulling them lines, brother, and you're tired, and you know, I don't know how I did it. Anybody ever said that before? I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I made it through. But by the grace of God. By the grace of God. He said, I'm not just telling you what to do. I'm giving you the cloud by day and I'm giving you the fire by night to help it get done. You see, God don't just tell you to go out there and run a quarter mile in five minutes. God will give you the fastest running shoes. He'll give you the training. He'll give you the basics and He'll put you in the right position to make sure you can accomplish what He tells you to do. There is nothing in the Word of God that is impossible for you to do. You say, well, that's hard. I don't know how I'm going to do it. It's because you're not having faith faith in the fact that he is that cloud by day and that fire by night. He's the one that still, do you know what he said? He said, thy word, it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do you know that the word of God is Christ Jesus? That word, sister, amen, uh, Rachel, this morning, what it tells me is that it's the cloud by day. That Bible, let me see your Bible for just a minute, brother. Let me see your Bible. That Bible, that word of God is a cloud by day and the fire by night. It's God saying, I've given you something to light your way. You know the reason why some people go adrift and they get astray and they've gone out and they've done other things of the world and fell away from God and the church. Many times it's because they got away from the light that leads their steps and they've stopped following the cloud. There are some folk that it was during the rough times they said, well, it was good to follow God. It was good. It was okay to follow that cloud when I was absolutely uncertain of the terrain I'm beginning to get a feel on things, you know. I'm going to preach to somebody because somebody's going to be listening to this and they need to hear this. I'm starting to get a feel of things, Pastor, and I'm starting to get my bearings again. I got me a good job, and, and I'm seeing this guy, and he's, 
he, he's just the best thing going, and my life's kind of coming together. I kind of am getting a feel of the lay of the land now. And so, you know, really, I don't need the cloud like I used to. I don't need the fire by night like I once did. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little detour here, and you stop following that cloud. That's where people get into trouble. That's where our children and our grandchildren, our families and our friends and our church members backslide on God is whenever they turn and they start having confidence in their ability to figure it all out on their own. Let me tell you, if you're listening right now, you're you're uncertain. You're confused. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Your whole life has been like a puzzle that has yet to be put together. Let me tell you what your problem is. Is that you fail to understand where your real help is. It's as if you got dropped off in the middle of an ocean, you have no anchor, and you're floating here and you're floating there. I heard Sister Linda Bauchman preach a message. I shared it on my Facebook timeline not too long ago. It's on the Spreaker account that we have. And she preached about the anchor, the anchor of the soul. Talked about how Christ was the anchor. And you know some folk, one of the things she said in that message that stood out to me She said when she began to look it up, she talked about how that the cord, the cable, or the rope that attaches that anchor to the boat, that is what helps hold steadfast that boat in place. Because the anchor can be lodged, but if the cable gets loose, if the cable breaks, the cable is severed, Well, you're not going, the anchor might still be there, but you're not going to be anchored. What is that rope like? I like the way Sister Bultman preached it, and I ain't going to re-preach her message, but she said that cable is like our faith. And when you stop having faith in the anchor, the anchor can't hold you. You wonder why you're drifting. You wonder why you're afloat. You wonder why that it's hitting, missing up and down and all around and you can't seem to find the right husband, the right wife, the right job, the right situation, the right church. Sometimes it's because you've lost faith and you're not anchored to that anchor with your faith because you've gone to miss. Can you say God help somebody? I want you to know this morning the value of that cloud. And I see it this morning understanding. God is not just, He's not just telling us what to do. But He's leading the way and showing us what to do. But too often, people in general, they see God like some supreme deity with a list of rules and laws. And here's God. He sits back with His arms folded And he's like a prison corrections officer, and he's watching to make sure, watching, looking for us to make a wrong move. That's not how God does. God is the one that gets in the trenches with you. God is the one that said, I'm with you always. I'm not just here telling you what to do with my arms folded, looking over your shoulder, waiting for you to mess up. So I can scold you and get on to you. I have to believe, Sister Misty, that God loves us more so than any mother or father could love a child. Would you agree with that? And what loving parent, how they would treat their child if they see them put their hand to something or fall or get hurt or something happens. A loving parent is going to try to redirect that child away from things that are going to hurt the child. So don't do that no more, son. That's going to lead to pain, and that's going to cause harm and injury. Don't do that anymore. You're trying to lead them away from the problem. I have to believe within myself this morning, Sister Deborah, that the fact is is that God loves you and me enough that when He sees or for He foresees a problem in our future, that God's trying to redirect us. Let me share something with you because somebody I know needs to hear this. I'm not trying to be prophetic here, but somebody needs to hear this. You're wondering to yourself why things are, are just up in the air right now. There's something going on in your life that's just up in the air. And I feel like that there's somebody, I don't know who it may be, but God is not just allowing things to be up in the air to cause you chaos and sorrow and dismay. But God is redirecting you. God is redirecting you in a different direction. 
And it's for your own good, your own protection, your own gain, and your own, your own walk with God. It's, God, I don't know what you're doing. You're doing something. I don't know how it's going to end. But if I'm out there in the wilderness and there's a lot of uncertainty on every hand, help me. Can you say that with me? Help me, Lord, to trust in you. You see, the Israelite people were not the only people dealing with uncertainty. If you have not noticed, our country is in a mess. There is uncertainty right now from the White House to the church house, from the schoolroom to the break room. People everywhere you look are having uncertainty. We have business owners right now. The James, they're uncertain. They don't know whether they should shut their business down. They should make people wear masks, whether they shouldn't wear masks. Some of these business owners are wondering, can we survive another shutdown? Sister Misty was sharing with me last night that at her work, they put everybody that works on that team together, they put them on a 14-day, a two-week, whatever, quarantine because someone that did work there had tested positive. Well, everybody that I'm aware that works there, aside from that one person, was negative. But this other person, still testing positive, cannot come back to work. But Sister Misty said, but Pastor, what happens if a few weeks down the road somebody else gets the virus? She said, we can't, I don't see how we can afford to just keep shutting down every time somebody gets a virus. How can we afford to do that? There are business owners right now that are in a place of absolute uncertainty. Right now, it's not a time to run from God. Right now, it's not a time to push God aside. If you're a business owner, the best thing you can do right now is the time to make sure you got a right relationship with God. Because when you're in the uncertainty of the wilderness, you better hope you got somebody that can see up ahead what you cannot see. You better hope you got a God that knows how to give you instruction and tell you what to do and when to do it. Because I don't care how high your IQ goes. I don't care how many bachelor's degrees or plaques you got on your wall. When you get into uncertain times like that, there are places you get into that only God Himself could tell you what the right thing is to do. Anyone agree? Say amen. You got school boards right now that are uncertain if they should open up or if it's too early to let the kids come back to school. Everybody's arguing because nobody knows what to do. You say these uncertain times are bringing out the worst in people. Let me tell you this. These uncertain times are only revealing what was already there. Because during uncertain times, people that are anchored in the rock, you're going to see the best in them. And the worst you see in others is only because it was already there, but uncertain times manifested it. But I want to know what are you made of? Have you got your feet anchored in the rock? Are you, is your mind made up? Are you anchored in Christ? Or what are you anchored in this morning? Come on and say amen. Pastors are uncertain whether those that are weak will survive the sifting without drifting. I made a post last night on my timeline as I began to pray and meditate talking with the Lord. And I asked this question, can you survive the sifting without drifting? Right now, the world as we know it, especially here in America, there's a sifting going on. I believe that sifting could be a product of the lax, amen, lukewarm state that the world and the church has been in for way too long, and God said, I've had enough. So there's a sifting going on. As a pastor, I can't help. There's an uncertainty. And I look around, and I think to myself, who will survive the sifting without drifting? Can you make it real for me, Pastor, so I can, you can break it down and make it easy to understand? All right, let me, let me try. Let me try. You have people that went to church that were barely hanging on. Sometimes they only went because their wife went. Some of them only went because mama went. Some of them only went just because they had been going every week in daily routine or weekly routine, and it's just part of things, and their heart was really not in it anyway. 
They were already weak as it was. They didn't pay attention whenever the service was going on. They really got up on Sunday mornings and dreaded having to go to church, to be honest with you. They were weak before it ever started. And as a pastor, you know that when the sifting begins, people that are already weak and they're not established and people that really don't want to serve the Lord and people that don't have their mind made up and they're not committed to the very end, There's a tendency to drift when the church says, well, we're going to cancel services and we're going to have you watching online. Now you got somebody sitting behind a cell phone screen or maybe a computer monitor or TV screen and they're watching the service. But there's no accountability. There's nobody around you to worship the Lord with you. You know, some people don't have their family. They don't have the rest of their church family. The pastor's not watching you. So while you're sitting there, you're weak. And while you're sitting there watching a few minutes of preaching, you a notification pops up and you go to that and you pay attention to that. You miss 10 minutes of preaching. And then you try to go back and pick up where you left off and you're not getting anything. And what you begin to do is during the sifting you begin to drift. A few services are canceled and and, uh, it's got you out of the routine and you don't have enough self-discipline to make sure that every time that that service comes on and you get a notification, oh, Grace Street's live. But you watch it. There was a poll not long ago that said that I think it was over 40% of the people polled about whether or not they were watching the live services from their church. Over 40% of the people said they weren't even watching their church's services. They were watching some other church. And a great majority of people weren't watching anything. Now, would you be concerned if you were a pastor that people are going to drift during the sifting? But I want you to know the way you're going to survive that sifting is you got to keep your eyes on that cloud. And you cannot take your eyes off of God. During this sifting, there will be some that are going to drift. There will be some. There already have been some. There have already been some that are like the seeds that he talked about that are scattered on different kinds of ground that have already fell by the wayside. And while you get discouraged and you look around and say, where's the rest of the church? You understand this. What it really in retrospect is is what you're really seeing in a great majority of your churches that the ones that have stayed were the only ones that really were in it in the right place for the first in the first place. Some of the other ones, uh, they didn't have, they weren't in it anyway. They were just there like visitors, uh, just coming, maybe frequent the place, uh, like coming to have a drink down at the bar. Uh, but there are some folk uh, who this means everything to them. Uh, Christ is everything to them. Uh, and you're not going to beat them away from the table of the Lord. You can't make them get away from God's table. They're going to pull up and die in one way or the other. There are a lot of folks right now that my heart bleeds for because they are sifting during this drifting. There are seniors right now that are uncertain whether to leave the house. There are senior citizens that are way up in their age and have underlying health conditions. They're uncertain. Should I leave the house? Is it safe to go to church? Is it all right to go to the grocery store? Sister Rachel told me, she said, whenever... This thing first started breaking loose. She said, I, I was kind of scared to even go to the store. I, you know, there's an uncertainty. We don't know what to do. We've never dealt with anything like this. I don't know about you, but I'm the same way. But adult children are uncertain whether it's safe to even visit their parents in the nursing home. Investors are uncertain whether to cash in or keep investing. I'm going to tell you something, as a, as a parent, as a grandparent, I'm looking at the social climate of our world today with all of this stuff, people back, back and forth about whether it's all lives matter, black lives matter, and everybody's, a, I mean, the media's playing it up, and they report stuff in such a way that it just causes an inflamed, uh, a, 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 a tense thing between all people. I mean, this ain't popping. I'm going to say it and hope that you don't tune out just because of this. But most people ought to agree with this. I don't care if you're black, white, green, is Kermit the Frog. But they don't report stuff the same way. 
If you have somebody on national, uh, if you have somebody in the news or whatever, and, and it's a, 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 a black on white crime, they don't say it like that. They just say elderly man got punched in the face by somebody else, you know, whatever. But they instigate it. And if you don't see that, you're blind. I'm not telling you there's not racial problems in the world. There are. But what I am telling you is, is that a lot of Christians have got caught up in this worldly secular mess. And as a, as a man of God, as a parent, as a grandparent, I look at the social climate of the world and I think to myself my God are we on the verge of a civil war within this country because people are going to finally get fed up with all this mess at some point I saw the other day where they went down to some street and painted giant letters uh, in big yellow letters black lives matter and some lady decided to go paint over it in black well the people that painted in yellow didn't get nothing done to them but the lady that painted over it in black now she's being charged with a hate crime I don't know how you figure in the world we're in a mess. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But I want to tell you something, folks. In the midst of it all, it's a people that love God. Let me tell you something, folks. There are people that love God that care less about black, white, green, purple, or any other color. They love people of all kinds. Let me tell you something. If you get caught up in the mess of this world, you get drugged down with this world. This uncertainty has got me troubled. But as I prayed last night, Sister Misty, I kept hearing the Lord say that He is the constant. As I've grown older, I'm 46 years old. Here in a few months, I'll be 47. I'm not as old as some, maybe older than a few. But in my 46, almost 47 years of life on this planet, I can assure you of the things that I'm beginning to see right now I've never seen anything quite like it. And it causes a great deal of uncertainty, sometimes even borderline fear of what might be ahead. I've learned in all those 46 plus years, there were years that I thought the government was doing okay. Anybody besides me? Well, I know some people, nobody can ever do anything right, but I'm talking about normal people. There were years that I absolutely hated it. Now, I didn't go out and break out windows out of no building or burn up police cars or anything crazy like that just because I didn't like who was the president or anything like that. But there were years I didn't care for the administration or the government. I've learned the government ain't my constant. The IRS ain't my constant. I've had jobs that I really, really liked. Anybody besides me? I mean, the work was work. That's what work is. It's work. Labor. But I liked the job. I liked the place I was working at. And they fired me or let me go. I found out that my boss, he ain't my constant. I've had people that Sister Myers and I got real close to. We help them move, loan them money, fix cars, fix appliances, try to be there, try to hold them up, try to defend their honor when people talk about them, only to have them same people stab me in the back, run off, and say the craziest stuff about us. I've learned that people are not my constant. I've had pastors that I had confidence in absolutely fail miserably. And I learned my pastor wasn't my constant. As much as I love my children, and I think the world of all three of them, I found out my kids ain't my constant. I will tell you this, though. I found out many times through the years when I thought the boat was going under. I've got to close, I know. I'm just, my heart's so full this morning. Please forgive me if I'm preaching long. But through these years, Sister Misty, there were times I thought the boat was going down, like the testimony that I give you where they put the notice in the door and they said that they were sending the whole entire property in three days to a tax deed auction. If we didn't come up with $1,800 and the church was already three or four months behind on his mortgage payment and our insurance was past due and I didn't know where the money was going to come from, I didn't know how we were going to do it, I thought we were done in. But guess what? 
Here it is, 2020. That was probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, and here we are. You know why? Because God was our constant. There were times that we had a family that decided just they were a a tithing family and it helped the church, uh, support the church financially and we were going through a difficult time and that family decided to leave and all of a sudden $900 in a month of tithes left the church when they left. And I looked around and said, we were already struggling. How are we going to make it? But it's 2020 and we're still here. God is still our constant There were times, Brother Coon, that I got sick in my body. They said, you got a brain tumor. There were times I'd get so dizzy, I'd have to go to the back of the church and lay down on the floor when I got done preaching. But it's 2020 and I'm still preaching because God is my constant. (laughs) Oh, my God in heaven. There were times that the enemy got on my shoulder when my son Devin was out and he wasn't serving the Lord and he, and he wasn't even trying. He was running from God, doing things he shouldn't do. And I think, oh God, will he ever come back? And yet he's trying to serve the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. I believe that God's going to be my constant for the other two. I know that God is going to be there. I know that everybody else may walk off and leave me, but God will be there. Can someone say Man. I have great respect for the organization of the Church of God. Because of the Church of God, I have this opportunity to pastor this church. I don't know anybody in any great position within the church. I don't rub elbows with the elite. I don't know any inside people. Back when our church looked like the doors were going to unfold, I called the state office. I told them what I was going through, and they said, we're so sorry to hear that. We'll be praying for you. And I said, well, is there anything the church of God can do to help us financially? They said, right now, to be honest with you, Brother Joe, said, because of all that went on, it's a long story about all the insurance problem that we had within the state of Florida and this and that and the other and the cutbacks because of the little depression dip, the recession we went through back in about 2009 or 10, said that we've had to make so many cutbacks, we just don't have it. I found out right then and there that the church of God, as much as I have a respect for the whole organization, was not my constant. But I'll tell you where the cloud was. It was close by. It was near. When I went through the greatest trial of my entire ministry and life, 2010, I had people whispering behind my back, people spreading rumors, people saying all kinds of things. My wife and I didn't even really want to visit places because we would go to a meeting and we'd have people looking around and stuff, and we were wondering what they were thinking or saying. Yeah. Yeah people that I'd preached for, people I've known for years, and then it gets back to you, things that they've said, and I found out they weren't my constant. Right here in front of this church, right about here, I don't know why I feel like telling this, but right here in front of this church, in the midst of my trial, I felt like the bottom was going to just completely fall out. I thought I was losing everything, including my wife, my marriage, my everything. I thought ministry, I didn't know what was going to happen. One night, the Holy Ghost laid me out right there. I still remember in my mind what I saw whenever the Spirit was on me. My eyes closed. I felt the Holy Ghost all over me. I saw these gray, dark gray figures that were flying. You could almost see through them. And like buzzards, they would circle around in the air. And ever so often, one would fly down like headed straight towards me. And then it would get close to me and it was almost like it would bounce off. And then another one would come and it would bounce off. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and told me this. The enemy can only get so close. Boy, I'm telling you, when I got out of that floor that night, Brother Eric, 
Man, I was like a Marine fresh out of boot camp. I felt like I could whoop everybody and everything in sight. Boy, I felt the boldness. You understand what I mean. Boy, I felt so bold in the Lord because I had got a word from God. I went home that night. And we walked into the bedroom. I was getting ready to take my wet clothes off from preaching and being in church. And uh, I began to tell my wife what the Lord had showed me while I was down there on the floor. And she just stopped and she looked at me. She said, are you sure? For a second I was taken back. I thought, are you questioning that the Lord spoke to me, you know? She said, are you sure? I said, yeah, honey, absolutely. I said, I'm telling you what the Lord showed me tonight. And he said, the enemy can only get so close. I said, I felt the Holy Ghost. She said, that's an answer. She reached over on the dresser and picked up a notebook that was laying on top of the dresser. She pulled out a letter. And she handed it to me. She said, I've been waiting. I didn't want to give you this. She said, but if you know God spoke to you, it's going to be all right. And I took that letter, and it was from the state attorney. It didn't look good. It didn't sound good. I looked at my wife, and I said, I know that I know what the Lord showed me. It's 2020, and I'm still here. You know why? Because He was my constant, and I was willing to constantly follow Him. But you stand all across the house, somebody. Boy, I'm going to tell you, the enemy will do everything he can to steal your joy, to take away your song, to cause you to lose track of your ministry, and throw up your hands. But as anybody said, it ain't going to happen in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want to close with this. Sister Miranda's coming to the piano. I want you to see this morning that just as the cloud of the Old Testament was a constant in the midst of their uncertainty, he's a constant even now. But the sad reality is this. People don't always trust Him to be the constant. The reality this morning, a sad reality, is that people don't always believe that He's really there. The sad reality is that in uncertain times, they don't lean on Him. And you may tell you what really struck me when the Holy Ghost shared this with me. Another sad reality that during uncertain times, people don't inquire of Him. What do you mean, Pastor? When, when tragedy and uncertainty happens, you'd be surprised how many Christians get on the phone and go calling friends and people. They don't inquire of the Lord and say, God, what do you think I ought to do about this broke down motor? What do you think I ought to do about this situation? Should I just go ahead and retire? You'd be surprised how many people that don't go to God and inquire of Him when it's uncertain. I don't know what to do. There may come a day, sis, that against your better discretion, that your husband ends up, you in a position where you don't know whether to put him in a rehab center or keep him at home. That'd be an uncertain place, wouldn't it? And that would try your faith. It's in those difficult times of your life that you have to understand that if you're going to get the help you need, you have to learn to inquire of him. You have to fall down on your face before God and say, God, I need absolute direction. I shared with some of you a testimony of how I prayed last night about a specific thing and how God showed me later that night that within 10 minutes that He had answered that prayer by proof of a phone call. Now, I want to challenge some of you that are in the altar. Maybe you're getting ready to pray right now. I want to challenge somebody that is willing to pray a specific prayer. I want you to hear that. Pray a specific prayer. There is something that you're not real certain about, you're not real sure about. You say, God, I need to know. I've got to know what to do about this. I've got to know what to do about this. 
when everything falls apart, when everything the seams come unraveled, I hear the Lord saying to the children of Israel, well, didn't I deliver you in the past? Wasn't I the one that led you? Am not I the one that kept you? And God's saying the same thing to you this morning. I want to give you this opportunity to come and find a place this morning and get in the altar and pray and seek the face of God. He is the cloud. I said He's the cloud right now. There are some things in your life that you're just not certain about. What, what, where are we headed? Where am I headed? What am I going to do? What's going to happen with my family? You say, Lord, even if that daycare does shut down again, and this time they can't pay us to sit home, Lord, you've been my constant up to now, and I'm going to trust you. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know whether my husband should take that job.